Good evening, and welcome to this concluding lecture in the 2008-09 series sponsored by the Religious and Psychological Wellbeing Project of the Center for the Study of Religion and Psychology at Boston University's Danielson Institute. My name is Robert Neville, the director of the project and of the institute, and I'm grateful to the MetaNexus Institute of the Templeton Foundation for its generous support of the project. Our lecturer this evening is Dr. Kane Chan, Chair of the Department of Public Policy and Public Affairs and Professor of Human Services at the McCormick Graduate School of the University of Massachusetts at Boston. She holds the PhD from Boston University's Clinical Psychology Program and is a licensed clinical psychologist. She currently is a supervising clinical psychologist for the Center of Multicultural Training in Psychology at the Boston Medical Center and previously has been on the staffs of the Boston Children's Hospital, Westboro State Hospital, and the South Cove Community Health Center. She's been a counseling psychologist for the Boston Juvenile Court and for the MBTA Police. Professor Chan authored the book, If It Runs in the Family, At Risk for Depression, and is especially expert in the field of the mental health of Asian Americans in which she has published many articles and book chapters. Most recently, she has published Counseling Chinese American Lesbians, Gay Men, and Bisexuals in Asian Voices, Emerging Needs in Asian Americans. She has been active professionally as a fellow of the American Psychological Association and has been president of the APA's Division 44. She has served as associate editor for the APA journal Professional Psychology, Research and Practice, and as chair of the Boston Women's Fund of Directors. With these splendid credentials, Professor Chan will address us this evening on the topic of sexuality and identity, an intersection with East Asian religious and family values. Welcome back to Boston University, Dr. Chan. Thank you for that. Is this a good, good amount of sound? Yeah, not too, not too loud, not too soft. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm very um, pleased to be here tonight, and I'd like to express my special appreciation to the, and I understand I spell Danielson with a, it should be spelled with an E, to the Albert and Jesse Danielson Institute, um, to Dr. Brian McCorkle, who um, invited me to speak and corresponded with me um, in January about this talk and gave me many ideas about it, and also um, to Sarah, I guess it's pronounced Clo, who, Cl Clough, who um, was very helpful when I asked about a number of logistics and everything. So uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I thank you for coming out on such a cold night, especially. Um, what I'd like to talk about is um, what, you know, what is really the intersection or what is the crossroads at which we look at religious beliefs religious values, cultural values, family values, personal values, and identity and sexuality. What I'm saying is there's a number of different concepts that we're putting together. And where you have the intersection is the place where all of these values meet. And sometimes where they meet, it's conflicting. And sometimes where they meet, they get along. <laughs> but not always. And so to me, how they affect each other and their overlay is much, the way I view it is much in terms of a lens. If you have, um, let's say you have glasses and you put a different color lens, you're gonna see the world by, if you put a yellow lens, things are gonna look yellow. If you put a, a darker lens, things will look darker. When you're looking at different issues of religion and, and family values and cultural values and how within one person these values affect their sense of identity, their sense of sexuality, their sense of behavior. That's where you're looking at different colored lenses coming together and creating even more different colors. So if you put a blue lens and a red lens, you get a purple lens. And so what I'd like you to think about is how these different lenses create different colors for in different individuals. So why do we care? I, I, so I had this picture of uh, some Asian Americans. Um, this is a, a group that um, some of my, my friends worked with, and this is a group 
is to show the diversity of Asian Americans. And so when I say, why do we care um, about Asian Americans? I mean, many people say Asians, there aren't that many of them. However, they can be influential in different ways. Asians are the fastest growing immigrant group in the United States. Now, they're not the fast, largest in number, but they are the fastest in terms of their increase in size. Between 1980, which is when I was at Boston University um, as a graduate student, and 2000, the Asian population in the United States nearly doubled, which is a tremendous difference. Um, when, when, when I was, uh, first came to Boston as a graduate student, and I, I grew up in Hawaii, in Honolulu, Hawaii, which is a, you know, a predominantly, I'd say, 60 to 75 percent Asian and Asian American uh, in terms of different mix, a strong Asian influence. When I first came to Boston, I thought, wow, there's not that many Asians here. Um, you know, there would be a couple of, you know, Chinese restaurants, a couple of Japanese restaurants, but you didn't have the, the numbers of Asians. I would often go many times to, to, you know, all kinds of events and be in the subway, and I would be the only Asian person. And I would look around, and it would, it would feel very different. And you don't, you don't realize um, how, how different it feels until you've been you know, in California or you've been in New York, you've been in places where, where you see a lot of Asian faces and it's very, it's very familiar to you as, a, as an Asian person. Um, so in the United States, the Asian population has doubled. In Massachusetts, it has doubled. Um, and the individuals of Asian heritage number almost 12 million or 4.2%, and that's currently. Um, the expectation is that in the next 20 to uh, 40 years, it will again double. So that will be, a, it will go up to 8% um, in the next 40 years. And so that's why, this is, why, why do we care? Why are we looking at Asian Americans and Asian beliefs? And this is why. Not only do they, is, is the population changing and there are going to be more Asians, but the influence, the influence of Asian culture, of Asian religions, of Asian values, um, is going to be larger than it is now, and it's going to be one that will cross over. Um, when I talk about the intersection, it's one that will create, I think, a stronger color lens in the way we think about American values in America. So what I'd like to do a little bit is kind of to challenge the dichotomies. And when I talk about what are dichotomies, well, when people think of dichotomies, they, th they think, well, what's, what's e Asian and what's Western? And that's a dichotomy. So people say, gee, we have Asian beliefs and Asian um, values, and we have Western beliefs and Western values. And when, when I think about that, I'd like to have us think about how is it um, that we, have, we don't have the extremes and that people don't stay either in the Western or the, or the European, um, Western European or Asian and um, Asian influence, but we have blends and hybrids. And much more so than people are aware, um, virtually everyone in this room is probably a blend, <laughs> is a blend. You are a blend of you know, your culture from, wet, from your, your culture of origin, your family, the cultural values of the place you grew up when you think about where you were as a child, your parents, and, and then where you are now. Certainly being at Boston University, and being in, in Boston, you, you take on um, different, different cultural norms, different cultural values, and they kind of creep in. Um, although you say, you know, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna maintain my, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna maintain my, fat, my culture. Um, slowly but surely, you, you start to become um, a hybrid. Some of the things we get used to in terms of um, behavior, in terms of expression, in terms of language even, those change over time, and you become more of a blend or a hybrid. So rather than saying, you know, there, there are dichotomous, dichotomous areas, um, I like to say where it is many times, you know, sort of like a uh, breakfast blend. We have blends and hybrids, and all of us are blends and hybrids. And that is true in terms of culture. It's true in terms of, um, I think, at least for Asian, very much um, religious values, and it's true in terms of sexuality and identity. Those are areas where there are, there are blends and hybrids, and just like in flowers, each individual um, has their own coloring, their own blend. And you can particularly see this within families where you have, um, well, my, my favorite thing is in plants, when you have hybrids, you can have like a, a rose hybrid, and you can have a yellow, you can have a plant that has a yellow rose 
and, and a pink rose on the same plant. And the first time I saw this, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> you know, I said, this is really true. And, and it is really true. And this is the, the reason I bring this up is that it's the same with families and siblings. People often say, you know, well, you, you grew up in the same place, you have the same families, you have the same parents, you have the same family, and yet you could have, um, and you know this from doing clinical work, you can have um, siblings have completely different, I would say, colors. <laughs> they are completely their own um, blends and their own hybrids. So th that individualism is something to keep in mind. Now, when I talk about East Asian, and I try to stay with East Asian rather than um, with, uh, with um, just using Asian because South Asian, as you know, Asia is a huge place. And for, for me to say, well, Asian values are such and such, you know, it would be saying like Americans are a certain way. And then you think about, well, you know, with America, you certainly have um, vast differences between regions, between cultures, uh, between our blue states and our red states. Um, in Asia, you have the same thing. <laughs> uh, we're just more aware of it when we think about, you know, those of us who, who grew up in the United States, you, you, we understand the diversity of the United States. And so when someone says, well, Americans are individualistic or Americans are um, aggressive, well, which Americans, right? You're talking a wide range. Um, and, there's, and it's the same with Asians. When we talk about Asians and Asian Americans, um, it's, in many ways, an Asian American is a political term for uh, people who are from Asia and who have a, a political identity as an Asian American. But what I want to stress, um, and you know, the, I, mean, I own many of you must be uh, counselors, uh, is that each person is a unique hybrid, and that you know we are indeed one of a kind, blended from diverse cultural elements. So, what I want when I say um, I'm going to talk a little bit about East Asian values, I am going to generalize, just as I said. Um, before each person is unique, and I don't want to generalize to make um, kind of sense of understanding cultural backgrounds and cultural, I think, values. You do have to do some generalization. So I, I am going to generalize, but I always want to say it as, a, as a caveat that although I generalize about East Asian cultures and I talk about different um, maybe cultural and religious values. Those are, again, generalizations for each person, it would be different, but they are kind of trends or where you have the mean would, would, would be a certain way. Obviously, you have individual differences. Um, so this was a picture that I, I put together that had some, what I consider some different looking and individual differences in terms of Asian groups um, <laughs> and Asians. Okay, so let me give an example. Um, uh, in terms of, of a comparison, you know, there's a widely ex accepted notion that one of the things that you can talk about in terms of Americans is that there are, um, in terms of cultural values, the main Im important cultural value for Americans is individualism, and we have that from the rugged individualism of the, you know, the, the wild, the wild west and the pushing out to the frontier. America was, you know, built, I think, in, in as a land, as a country. Um, based on individuals coming here and, and saying, you know, we have freedom for liberty and individual rights. And the First Amendment, you know, the right to free speech, the right for any individual to pursue their individual happiness. So we believe that. In America, we believe that um, any individual can make it on their own. We believe in the, you know, sort of meritocracy of using, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And the task in American development, you know, in, in our upbringing with our children, is really to help our children become self-sufficient. We help them to be independent. When um, my daughter was born, I remember one of the first things that one of my friends said to me was, now your job is to help her separate. And I said, she was just born. <laughs> what do you mean? They said, no, no, she has to be independent. She's an American. And you, know, you, can't treat her, you, know, you can't treat her just like an Asian. And I said, wow, <laughs> this is a different country. Um, but. The skills that are valued because of that, you know, your, your job is to become self-sufficient as, a, as, as a, an individual and the adolescent task is to separate um, from, from your family and to be independent and that's sort of a cultural value that is Western and is, is, is American. Uh, so as a result, the skills that we value, some of the skills that we value are self-promotion, assertiveness, speaking up, throwing, drawing attention to yourself and your ideas, you know, raising your hand in class, and saying something, say, you know, 
even even the whole discourse of the way you talk, say, well, you know, when, when you're writing in the humanities, you say, well, I argue that, and you argue your point, as opposed to bringing things together and say, you know, as a group, we believe this. <laughs> it's a very different uh, way of thinking. Um, and rewards of our culture because of this individualism are distributed based on your individual um, merit and what you have contributed in terms of as, as an individual. So your status, or the status, although it could be hierarchical, certainly we don't distribute salaries um, equally, um, the, the focus still is on the individual. And in other cultures, in Asian cultures, which are collective cultures, um, the, 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 group, the group concept and the group cohesion is a much stronger importance. Um, group orientation is heavily emphasized. The needs of the group come first before your own individual needs. The identity is not focused necessarily on yourself and you know, the, the um, self-promotion, self-assertiveness, but it's focused on what you contribute within your family, within your um, community, uh, within the, 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 the extended family. And I can give many examples of this. I'll just give a few. One, um, one example is, is recently um, I was talking to a, a friend of mine, and he was saying that his father um, was his father sort of you know was had, had worked it for many years, and he, he's from a Japanese family in Hawaii, and he said he re, he he sort of regretted that he didn't go to school, and his son said to him, you know, well, Dad, why didn't you go to school um, when you when you were um, graduating from high school, and he said, oh well, it's because your uncle Bill became Doctor Uncle Bill, and your 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 uncle Bill went to medical school, and. And so, you know, my friend said, well, and I, I was there. And he said, why? What, what difference is it that Uncle Bill went to school? And he said, well, in our family, you know, we, could, we had five boys, and we could only afford to send one person um, to, to college. And, and, he, and so we pooled our resources. And the family, we had a meeting, and the family said, who is the most likely to succeed? <laughs> and this was like only, you know, not that many years ago. Um, and they decided that Bill was the most likely to succeed. And, all the other sons gave up um, their, their opportunity to go to school, to, um, to get an education. Um, they all became laborers. And I was very, of course, intrigued by this. And I said, did you, did you ever regret this? Did you understand that um, you know, this is a different country? You, you should have had the opportunity. Um, perhaps you could have gone into the military or you know, do something else. And he said, no, it was never, you would never have thought of it. You know, it it's, it's what you do for your family. And your, this is, that was my role. That was my role that we decided on that was assigned to me. And I never regretted it um, because you know, this was the best thing for my family. Um, although I do wish I had gone to school, he said. <laughs> and so that, that was his way of urging his children to, to get an education, to defer that, but that, that family. Um, Another, um, an another very common one, I used to um, do some counseling in a co college counseling center out um, at a women's college nearby. And uh, I had many students who were tell would tell me, uh, women students from, from Asia, from Korea, from Japan, um, from China, who would tell me that they, um, they couldn't major in other than what their parents wanted them to major in, and they couldn't date other than who their parents wanted them to date. And there was some conflict about it, and that's why they were seeing me. I mean, obviously, if they had no conflict, they wouldn't have come to the counseling center. They had some conflict about it. But I would say, you know, this is uh, in the 1990s. Uniformly, um, when it came to the decision, people would always say um, that the expectation was to do what the family expected and what the family wanted. And so the, the importance of um, what they needed to do for the family was more important than any personal desire they had. And one of the things that they came to me about was that their friends didn't understand it. It was like, how do, you know, their friends think that she's, my friend think I'm crazy because I won't date this guy or I won't go into, I can't go into psychology when I want to. I'm going to have to major, you know, in business or in management um, because of my family's desire. Uh, but, you know, I think I understood it. So I would say, you know, sometimes you have to make your own decisions. And sometimes your own decision could be your family's decision, which is a hard thing, for, I think, for Americans to understand. Um, so. so what is valued in, in collectivist cultures? Um, there's you know, accommodating, blending in, avoiding conflict. Um, there's that 
classic statement, you know, that the, the nail that sticks up is the one that is the Japanese, is the Japanese um, uh, phrase, that the nail that sticks up is the one that gets hammered down. And so there's uh, certainly a premium and a value on being accommodating, on blending in, and, and not um, playing the traditional and, and conservative role, not standing out. Which is, which is different from American uh, culture. The kinds of skills you have are around group cohesion. You share your successes, both monetary and otherwise. Um, like, like in the film Slumdog Millionaire, when you had the Academy Awards, everybody came down. It, was, it wasn't just, it was the first time you saw everybody come down. There might, maybe there were 15 people on stage. And it's a sense of a group sharing, not just the, the three producers. Um, is, there really is a sense of, um, a group success as opposed to an individual success. Um, in addition, you have a desire to contribute to group success without um, expecting individual recognition. There's a strong um, value placed on cooperation, on modesty about your own contributions because it's only one of a part, being part of a team, deference to others, including especially parents and authority figures, and even a distribution of rewards um, and status to those in the lower ends. And when I understood my understanding about teams in other countries, uh, baseball teams in particular, like you have the Japanese baseball teams who are playing in the WBC right now, I think, against Korea, actually. <laughs> I think it's today. Um, my understanding from, from reading about this and, and talking to people is that you don't have, you do have a difference in terms of pay range, but it's not nearly as, um, as wider range as in the United States where you have teams with you know, players making $20 million a year and other players making you know, 500,000 or well, maybe it's a million is the lowest now, but there's quite a range. In, in Asian countries, the, there would never be that kind of a range. It would be a much smaller range. And to my, my family you know, grew up in Shanghai and was from China and I was born there. And, um, they talked about communism in a really interesting way to me. You know, my father said, you know, at first he said, I couldn't understand how China could become communist because, chi because Chinese people are very capitalistic. <laughs> they like to make money. You know, he said, money is very important to Chinese, you know, and the making of money, businesses, you know, uh, your, the, your opportunity to make money is, is really like a birthright. He said, but on the other hand, he said, I understand how communism could take hold in some ways because it is about the group. It is that the, the group's greater good is greater than your own and that no one person's, um, no one person's advantages would make up for hurting the community or the group. And they talk about, you know, in China about the progress which we could in some ways never have in the United States where, um, for example, Shanghai, they, when they built the subway, they just came to a bunch of homes and said, we're taking your homes and you're going to have to move. And there are some that protested, but, you know, very few. Uh, certainly, you know, protesting wouldn't have made that much difference. But there is a sense of, I understand that for the greater good to have a subway, it's, it, I can't keep my home. <laughs> um, so there are some paradoxes, I think, about collectivism um, and, and communism in China. Um, the, the, the other slightly accommodating avoidance of conflict um, issue is, is around pr expression. Uh, one thing that I've always learned is that Asian people and Chinese people in particular um, try not to, try to avoid conflict in terms of direct um, saying something negative. So everything is in the indirect and this is where you, um, this is where you understand personal expression in a cultural context. Um, I think this is important for therapists because American therapy, um, traditional Western therapy, people always ask you directly, like, be direct, say what you think, you know, ask people what they feel. And certainly, I think for, for a Asians and for, for um, Chinese, you, you don't want to be direct. You try to be as indirect as possible. My favorite story, um, which is actually a true one that I, I, I know about, um, was I had a friend whose daughter was uh, playing, learning how to play the piano. 
and she lived in, in Hawaii, the houses are close together and the windows are always open, it's like in the summer here. So you can hear everything. So she was playing, she was learning to play the piano and she was very diligent and she was practicing all the time. So um, one day she, her neighbor saw the, um, the husband and said, the father, and said, gee, I understand your daughter's playing the piano. And he said, oh yes, she's learning to play piano, she's doing really well. And he says, I see, he says, I, I can understand, you know, I hear that she practices all the time. And, and the father said, yes, he does, you know, she's, she's very diligent. He goes, yes, she practices all the time. And he came home that night and he said to his wife, she's playing too much at night. <laughs> the neighbor's complaining. <laughs> and, that, and that literally was true. And that, um, that is the way you, 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 know, you, you, you express yourself indirectly. You allow both sides to say face. You know, the man's not, he's not embarrassed. You don't have to tell him your daughter's playing, is keeping me up at night, it's too much, too loud. Um, but you get your message across. Both sides understand. Another common thing would be if, let's say, I, I would be going to um, Washington, D.C., and I have a friend who lives there. Instead of saying, calling up and saying, gee, I'm coming, you know, for the weekend, I'm going to a conference, um, you know, could I stay at your home? You can't ask, could I stay at your home? Because it doesn't give her a chance to say no in a graceful way. So what you would say is, I'm coming to Washington, I'm going to be at a conference that's sort of near your area. Can you recommend a hotel or a motel that would be convenient nearby so I could see you and go to the conference? And, and at, at that point, the person could either recommend one, in which case you know, or the person could say, oh, no, no, why don't you stay with me? And that allows them the opportunity um, to, to say, so that's the indirect, and it's a real art, and it's a complete part of, of Asian culture. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so in terms of, um, you know, conformity and conventional and traditional behavior can also in, um, include religious beliefs, and I'll, I'll tell, talk more about that in a minute uh, when I talk about the sort of dominant religious um, values of um, East Asians. So uh, the family is, of course, the basic unit in East Asian societies. Um, it values interdependence upon family members. And inter just like you know, my, my friend's father, who uh, gave up his opportunity to go to school. Uh, but the thing is, once his, once his brother uh, became a doctor, he, was, he helped out with the family, all of the family. So rather than saying, well, you should be independent and, you know, be stand on your own, there is a strong value for interdependence. And it's not, um, and so for family, for young people to live with their parents after they uh, graduate from college or, you know, where they're working, it's valued. It's not, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> um, whereas, in, you know, in American society, people would say, oh, you know, 35-year-old, 40-year-old living with his parents, um, you know, it wouldn't necessarily, or uh, a young couple who gets married and lives with, with, with parents, that is, that is value, that, that's kind of interdependence and familial um, dependence. The gender roles and the familial roles are very well defined and they're primary, they're more important than external relations. Um, so there's a little sense of a, an identity beyond, when, when you're born you're a son or you're a daughter um, and you're also a sibling, so you're a sister or you're a brother. Um, your grandchild, and those are your primary roles. When you get older, you, you become a husband and you become um, a father, but nevertheless, the role that was your first role, the primary role in terms of being a son, is still, and, and, and sibling, is still very much important. And it actually is a hierarchy of value, um, of, of roles, so that we're in American society, of course we would say, you know, your, your partner or your wife, or your, even your best friend would be, you know, as important as your family, that would not necessarily be true. And parents expect this, so they expect obedience, they expect loyalty. Um, be, you know, in the United States we have, um, we have, like at BU, we have students living in dormitories and students going away, being independent from their parents, uh, learning how to live on their own. In many places in Asia that would be you know, unheard of that you would expect to live at home and to um, only live away from home if you absolutely had to, that the goal was to keep the, um, the family unit. Now, in terms of looking at um, uh, Asian and Asian American values, 
I do want to talk about the differences. I mean, all of you know that Asia it has, um, has particular beliefs and, and traditions, and we talk about traditional Asian values. Now, I understand, too, um, and I was recently in Shanghai a year ago, you know, I understand, too, that in our minds, we have a belief of what Asia was like when our families were there. And it, 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 in some ways, the immigrant families keep the values frozen in time even better <laughs> than the actual countries where people change, um, where Shanghai, where any, any place, many places in Asia, you know, are not isolated and anymore and the beliefs and the values change. So there is, there is a global society and global cultures. Um, but when I, I'm, so I'm trying to look back and say, well, let's see where the um, origins of East Asian religious beliefs and cultural values come from. And I purposely tie those together because the religious beliefs and the cultural values are, are interconnected. So um, I'm sure you are familiar with the three dominant religious beliefs and values in East Asia, um, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. And I'll say a few words first about Confucianism. Um, Confucius was the single, you know, was of course the single greatest influence um, on East Asian philosophy and society. Um, he was both. I, I, I kind of joke about it, but I, I say he was both a philosopher and, and a psychologist. And the reason I say he's a psychologist because relationships are central to Confucianism. Um, particular duties arise from one's particular situation in relation to other. So the individual stands, you know, simultaneously in different relation, relationships with different people. So if you're a son, you're a, as a junior in relation to your parents and your elders, but you're, um, you're a senior to your, your younger siblings and younger people, um, to students. So everything is very much um, prescribed in terms of your, um, your relationship to someone. And that's how the greatest goal of Confucianism is social harmony. Uh, therefore, social harmony results from every individual knowing his or her place in the actual order and playing his or her role well. So it's a very organized <laughs> society. What, what is social harmony? It's very organized. It's when everyone knows their roles and, and plays their role. Um, many, you, I'm sure someone I'll ask, um, could tell me, what is the most important of the Confucian values? Your relationship from whom to whom? Hmm? Filial piety. Filial piety. <laughs> right. It's considered, of course, the greatest of virtues. Everyone knows about filial piety. And it must be shown toward, both toward the living and toward the dead, even remote ancestors. Um, so that sense of knowing where you are in, in terms of a chain of relationships um, is important. And, but particularly, you know, filial piety means the respect from a child to his parents, um, particularly a son. And this is the, the most important, you know, relationship. Um, then there are also the other relationships of ruler to the subject, father to the son, husband to the wife, elder brother to the younger brother, and then friend to friend. But the most important is um, the filial piety of the father to the son. So, the importance, um, let me just go back to this one. Um, the importance in terms of Confucianism is um, special duties and special respect is extended to the dead, where the living stood as sons to the deceased family, the veneration of ancestors. And while most religions um, are defined as having a god or a group of gods, an organized priesthood, perhaps a belief in life after death, or established traditions, um, Confucianism doesn't really have that. But Confucianism, so sometimes people debate whether, you know, is it actually a religion? Sometimes people say, well, Confucianism is more of a, of a philosophy or it's more of um, social, so, social rules. Um, but the effect on East Asian and Chinese societies is immense. Um, it really does. It is the original. It parallels the effects of religious movements in other cultures. Um, if you follow the teachings of Confucius, it, has, it does have a great deal of ceremony. And it does give a comprehensive and, I think, comforting for many people, because it is so structured and um, definitive. 
gives you a, a very much of a comprehensive explanation of the world and your relationships. Um, and one thing that people don't necessarily understand who are not from Asia is that um, religions are not necessarily exclusive entities, that there can be a um, number of different traditions and tenets that you follow. And there can be complete cognitive you know, um, comfort with all of them. So one can practice religions um, such as you know, Taoism, Confucian, uh, Taoism, Christianity, Judaism, um, Baha'i, Islam, Shinto, Hinduism, and still profess Confucian beliefs and still practice them actually in terms of one's relationships and the way one, one, one raises one's children. Um, Confucianism does permeate all Asian societies, particularly in East Asia. And the highly structured gender and generational roles seen within the East Asian family, in which the parent, child, father, um, mother, and older sibling, younger sibling roles are very well defined. One of the, the things I'm, I'm talking about um, later on in this lecture is about sexuality and identity. And homosexual relationships I will say right now, in terms of Confucianism, are seen as somewhat pl problematic because they challenge the, the, um, the order. Um, they don't fit into the Confucian order. There are simply no rules that dictate hierarchical roles for two men or two women who are romantically or sexually involved. Um, for so society at large, such a relation can be seen as you know, un unfathomable um, and certainly not officially recognized. So for the same-sex couple, relationships can be particularly difficult to negotiate unless they follow pre-existing roles, such as one of, the <laughs> one of the roles that one could take is the younger, older brother, younger brother. Um, but that is more of a teaching role as, as opposed to a um, relational or a sexual role. But that has been used by, um, by some saying, well, it is like a younger brother, older brother, Confucian role. Um, let me talk a little bit about Taoism. Taoism is a philosophy and religion. It was developed in the fifth century BC. It focuses on the individual's experience of life um, and supports tranquility and practicality as personal ideals. Uh, this influence is seen in the East Asian family where strife and conflict among family members is strongly discouraged and peacefulness um, in the household is of great importance. The heart of Taoist religion was sprung out of philosophy utilizes the ancient principles of yin and, yin, and, yin and yang, in which all things are made of either yin, the weak, passive, and negative force, and yang, which is the strong, positive, active force. The harmony of yin and yang is believed to be the key to happiness and, and the um, rightful order. Uh, this concept is known you know, even in the West, this, the, the terms of a harmonious union, and, um, and it is central is very much a central philosophical theme across all Asia. The harmonious union in terms of sexuality is symbolized by the marriage of female and male as to the pinnacle of human fulfillness, fulfillment. Um, females are associated with yin, males are associated with yang, the, the, the strength and the, um, uh, the more weak force. Um, thus, same-sex relationships may disrupt not only the Confucius order um, Confucianist order of the family, but they're also viewed as violating the natural balance of yin and yang. So the expectation of heterosexual marriage and the power, powerful association of yin, yang, and female-male relationships both serves to obscure and trivialize same-sex relationships. For example, the fact that a 35-year-old daughter is unmarried um, may be of greater concern to her parents if she engages in same-sex relationships. The focus here is not on her sexuality, but on how her behavior may disrupt the natural order of heterosexual marriage and family and her potential for yin-yang fulfillment. The final major traditional influence on East Asian religions and philosophy is Buddhism, of course, um, which was introduced to China from India in the first century AD. The central premise um, of Buddhism is that emptying oneself of one's desires is one of the keys to personal salvation. Um, this emptying involves the voiding of one's personal desires as a way of channeling the divine and accepting one's fate. Um, over lifetimes of reincarnation, the path leads eventually for the spiritual heaven. 
nirvana. The impact of Buddhism um, on, on the East Asian family is actually quite, quite large and it is not incongruent with um, the, the previous values in terms of uh, Confucianism and Taoism. Um, in terms of the subordination, the cultural value of subordination of your individual will, um, whereas the hegemonic American has a strong will and aims to achieve self-actualization, the traditional East Asian accepts his or her role in society in terms of, um, of, of understanding her, his or her relationships and is emptied of selfish personal desires, as in Buddhism. For example, parents refrain from being indulgent and from engaging sometimes in too much um, indulgent of their children because this may encourage personal willfulness. The emptying of desire in Buddhist thought involves sexuality and following one's sexual desires can be discouraged. At the very least, the pursuit of sexual fulfillment is traditionally viewed sometimes as vulgar and vain, and at the most, it disrupts not only the Confucian and the Taoist order, but will also slow one's path to salvation. Any sexual activity outside the confines and the context of marriage is seen in this light, but this is particularly true of homosexuality because same-sex activity is not visible in society or even discussed. Therefore, homosexual behavior can be seen in this context, in the Buddhist context, of pursuing one's sexual lust. But it must be noted, however, that although homosexual behavior itself um, is a reflection um, of impurity according to Buddhism, there is no concept of homosexuality itself as a sin, nor is it reflective of other internal flaws, and thus, unlike in Christian, some forms of Christianity, engaging in homosexual activity will not result in divine punishment. It is just not in keeping with the roles and where one's desire should be. Okay. Um, these three forces, I would call them forces, Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, um, and you know, as a child growing up, and I'd be interested in hearing after I finish talking, um, how some of the other people who are familiar with these um, religions or, or grew up with them, with the values, um, how whether you knew which, which values and which beliefs were what, because it was just intertwined and very much a part of being in an Asian family, I think. Um, so it can coexist in a curious mixture <laughs> and shape the nature of relationships within the family. Um, these familiar, familial relationships are defined by literally centuries of religious, philosophical, and cultural tradition. And how you separate those is, is um, I think, a very difficult task. Um, I think that the, the religious values, the philosophical values, and the family cultural values are all very much um, intertwined, and they really do shape the, the ways in which parents um, try to shape, the, shape their children's behavior and their children's uh, desires. Western psychological theories of family systems and interpersonal relationships often can fall short in understanding the East Asian family because familial relationships are strongly defined by many variants of religious, philosophical, and family traditions. Only in the context of this tradition can East Asian family dynamics be adequately even understood or examined, um, which may help explain some of the more complex issues and conflicts that the Asian, um, Asian Americans face. So in, in both the United States, let me just stop with, look at, um, say this. In both the United States and Asia, Christianity has um, become a larger part of the lives of a sizable number of East Asian families, um, particularly in Korean and Chinese communities, less so in Japanese communities, but to some extent as well, certainly in uh, Southeast Asia and Vietnam. Um, when, when you think about um, how Taoism, Confucianism, and the tenets of Buddhism have influenced and shaped one another, um, they all have embraced a kind of humanistic philosophy that emphasizes moral behavior and human perfection. Um, in time, most Chinese people, most East Asian people identify to some extent with all three traditions simultaneously. 
What is more recent is that they have also begun identifying with some aspects of Christianity. And, and I, I think in the Western um, thought, we don't really, we often don't understand in the United States that you can have what seems to be diverse and diff, um, different beliefs uh, m blending and being you know, completely congruent within one person. So what does this mean, all these mean, in terms of um, identity, sexuality, sexual behavior, personal and sexual identity, which is the, my, my main question was um, looking at these aspects in terms of culture, in terms of um, beliefs. First, cultural religion, um, in, when you look at religion in terms of a cultural context, um, several religious beliefs, including Christianity, coexist for many East Asians. Um, many believe and follow. It's not really, my, my mother used to talk about it. She would say, uh, when I was a child, we would, we would often go to a, a Protestant church, um, on particularly the you know, Easter and Christmas, but often other times, we'd often go to the Buddhist temple. And we also did you know, the ancestor worship. We went and um, we had the incense and all these things. And I remember talking to my mother about it as a kid, and I'd say, you know, my friends are either you know, Catholic or they're, I went to a, a school that was uh, originally founded by missionaries. Um, in fact, it's a school, it's called Punahou, and it's where Barack Obama attended for, for eight years. And I also went to that same school for nine years. And if you look at the Punahou website and it says, you know, what is, um, what is the religious belief or what is the, what is the religion, it would say um, non-denominational. But in, in effect, but because it was founded by missionaries, it had a strong Protestant core. And we sang hymns, Protestant hymns and things. But I remember growing up and asking my mother, you know, I, I don't understand. My friends, you know, only go to Catholic church or they only go to um, the Unitarian church or they go to the, um, they go to the Baptist church. And, or my, my other friends, my Japanese friends, they go to temple. How can we go to sort of different ones? And my mother would say, well, because we're not sure. <laughs> she literally would say, well, we're really not sure. And because she said, I grew up in China and I went to, you know, I, went, I was educated in a, a Catholic school, so I'm exposed to that. But my family, you know, always believed in the ancestor worship and in, in, in the Confucius principles. And she said, and, and then, you know, everybody also went to the Buddhist temple and we did the dances and we did the, the worship at the Buddhist temple because, um, because it makes sense too about reincarnation. And she said, you know, there's probably another life and people are, are um, come back in another form. So I grew up really believing that a number of different beliefs can coexist. And I think this is very common for, for, for East Asians. Um, but what is, I think, key in terms of understanding um, behavior, in terms of sexual behavior, in terms of um, interpersonal behavior, is that the, this true kind of Confucian principles around, um, around relationships and, and your role is, is probably the first one. And then there are a number of different other lenses or layers depending on the way um, that, that your, own, your own family experience and your own religious context gave you belief. Um, but Christianity is, is really a, quite a force now in, in, um, in terms of the lives of many East Asians. Um, in the United States, for Asian Americans, because of the immigration patterns and the sponsorship of people, refugees particularly, by churches, many people have um, come to uh, convert to you know, come to identify as, as Christians. However, once again, um, the, el the, the elements, the influences um, of the Asian uh, religions are really retained through a Christian lens. And there is, there is um, a sense that it is not, um, they're not competing whatsoever. In looking at sexuality and identity within the Asian cultural context, um, we think about the ways in which language and behavior whether homosexual or heterosexual, um, are unseen and unheard in, Chinese, in Asian American families. And I'm talking about sexual language, sexual behavior, um, sexual discussion of sexuality. Um, both of those are really considered uh, in general to be, to be um, unseen and unheard of. And if you think about the Confucian background in terms of the hierarchy of loyalties, 
Um, one's loyalty is first to one's parents, second to one's siblings, and third and last to the spouse or partner. So, so in terms of where you're placing your energy, your sexuality is, is later. <laughs> you have to fulfill all your obligations to your family first. Um, now, in addition to traditional family expectations, any overt acknowledgement of a lesbian or gay or bisexual identity um, may be more restricted by Asian cultural norms or conformity. And I talk about results in my study. Um, what I looked at, um, and this is one of the, the reasons I started looking at the, the religious background, the cultural background, the cultural values of um, Asians and Asian Americans, was I, I did a study in, in 1995 that focused on um, Asian Americans, Asians and Asian Americans, because some were, um, did not consider themselves um, Americans, uh, who I did a study of about 100 people and I looked at people who considered themselves or said that they were um, lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And I didn't ask that they, ident that they said they had an identity as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, but that their behaviors could be considered. And that's a very important distinction, saying looking at identity versus um, behaviors. So I asked about behaviors, and this was um, sort of following much of the work on HIV and AIDS, and where people started looking at sexual behaviors instead of sexual identity because um, identity is, is different from um, behavior. So I looked at behavior and what I found was when I asked about behavior and identity, what I found was that many lesbian and gay identified or bisexual identified Asians and Asian Americans talked about um, having trouble um, coming out or when, when we looked at the uh, comparison of how many years people, quote, came out, which of course is an Ameri American or Western concept, but acknowledged their gay, gay or sexual, um, uh, bisexual or lesbian identity to other people when they came out, that Asians came out considerably and significantly later than did, um, did, did non-Asians, so did, Amer did, did uh, both actually, both uh, African American, Latino, and white Americans, Caucasian Americans. So Asians came out at later, first came out later, and secondly, when we asked if you came out, who did you come out to? Um, virtually none of the Asian and Asian identified, um, gay and lesbian identified people came out to their families. In fact, many of them, if they came out to someone, would come out to their sister, but almost no one uh, came out to their parents. And that's, I, I thought that was, that was a very interesting finding because at this time there were, there were a number of um, political movements, you know, as well as, um, as well as anthropologists who were saying that um, when, peop when gay and lesbian people come out, um, they, they find their community, they find their home, uh, they, they, it, it's very freeing. And what I found was for many Asians, um, coming out, if they came out or if they identified themselves as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, it meant actually leaving home and leaving their community and leaving their families as opposed to embracing um, a family or a community. And they felt that the cultural norms of conformity um, really spoke against um, being different and coming out. And I, I always found that to be an interesting thing that um, people, you know, sort of like some, many of you probably saw the, the, the movie Milk um, in which, uh, Sha, you know, Sean Penn pays Harvey Milk and, and it's, a, it's a wonderful movie because it shows his enthusiasm, Harvey Milk's enthusiasm and his, um, and his desire for everyone, you know, to, to come out and, 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 you know, come out, come out wherever you are and, and be heard and how freeing it is. And I always understood um, in terms of my work uh, clinically as well as my studies and every, everyone I, I talked to, both male and female, that coming out was not necessarily a healthy or freeing thing for Asian Americans. That for some it could be, and, um, but for many it was not. That it would, meant giving up so much more than they would gain, that it was not worth it. And so um, uh, Eduardo Morales and myself and a number of other um, uh, psychologists of color really 
fought back against that um, in terms of you know, the talk about coming out and the gay affirmative psychology and are saying it's not necessarily true um, that it's a healthy and important thing for, for Asian and Asian Americans. And it was always the, the sense that if you didn't come out, then you were trying to be too private and shameful. That if, if, you, were, you, know, if you were afraid to come out, it must mean that you, were, um, you felt some, a great deal of shame. And that wasn't necessarily true. Um, I always wrote about the private public split um, within, um, within Asian society, Asian culture, that there is a greater sense of privacy. There, much, much of what we experience and, and, and feel is, is more private. Sexuality would certainly be private. So there's a certain silence. Silence does not necessarily mean invisibility. Um, and the pub, private versus public expressions of behavior and sexuality um, many ways are, are similar to the indirect um, verbal expressions and that, um, that the, the private expressions of sexuality uh, within Asian Americans and Asians did not necessarily mean that it, they felt shame, but rather that they felt this was private. <laughs> Let me get some water. In addition, there, I looked at strength and resilience for, um, for Asian American and Asian gay men, lesbians, bisex, bisexual, and, and heterosexual um, young adults. And what we found was that sexuality, ironically, within the Asian culture, could be more fluid and less rigidly defined um, than, I'm missing my D, more, less rigidly defined than in Western culture, where we don't have necessarily the dichotomies of, are you gay? you're either gay or you're straight or you're bisexual, but that sexuality is more fluid. Um, and what we can't assume is that Asian sexuality and sexual behavior, sexual identity, follows Western prototypes. So you, what, if, you're, if you're working with people, if you're meeting people, if you're just around people who are Asian, you have to be more alert to specific situation on cultural values that, want, that often people feel that um, quote, less developed cultures, once they become more developed in terms of um, sexuality, that there will be a similar Western coming out, there will be a similar identity politics, a similar identification, and a similar freedom for being um, a sexual minority. But this is just not true for other societies. And it's not that they're underdeveloped, it's that it is a different type of, um, uh, of cultural value. So I'm just going to give two short cases, and I'll, I'll, I'm almost done. Um, I wanted to talk about the case of Kathy. I, I think that often you, know, you can talk about lots of ideas, but until you talk about them in terms of real people, um, lots of people don't understand, can't, can't keep the concept. So let me just, this is a case that I wrote up. Um, a native of Seoul, Korea, Kathy moved to New York City with her family when she was 12. Uh, Hardworking, serious, and academic successful in high school, Kathy spent most of her time throughout high school at the family restaurant. She worked or studied when business was slow, but she was almost always there. When Kathy came to the Boston area to attend college, it was her first experience having independence and free time that was not tied up with work or family responsibility. Shy and reserved as a high school student, she established her first close relationships with people other than family members while she was in college and she began to socialize more. During her junior year, Kathy spent a great deal of time with Darlene, a close Caucasian women friend. She began to feel very attracted to Darlene and started talking about her like she was a sister. Eventually, they began to spend nights together, and after a while, they had, had their first night of sexual intimacy. Kathy felt both frightened and excited by these feelings. Um, this experience led her to seek psychotherapy. She, praised, she phrased the presenting issue as, I think I'm in love with a woman, and I don't know what to do. I do want to spend my time with her, but my family found out they would disown me. And when I think about my family, I feel incredibly disloyal to them. They're not spending their money to send me to college to have a relationship with a woman. Um, initial therapy sessions focused on her understanding of herself and how she felt she could not be an independent person, even at 21 years of age. Um, because she was expected to behave in ways that her family would approve. 
she said 21 was like being a baby to her. <laughs> she said, I know this is the age that Americans uh, become independent and adults, but for us, she said, I'm, I'm still um, very much a daughter and, and expected to be um, under my parents' control. Uh, her new relationship and behavior with her female lover were the first actions in her entire life that did not meet her family expectations, and she felt great cognitive dissonance at experiencing so much pleasure from something her parents would find so horrible. <laughs> Although she was able to tolerate this dissonance for a short time, Kathy began to feel more and more disloyal and torn as a dutiful daughter in not telling her family about her relationship and activities. She felt that her only options were to discontinue the relationship in order to be honest with her family and her life, um, or to continue the relationship but lie to her family about her activities. Neither seemed to be viable alternatives to Kathy, and she felt extremely stuck. Um, I would say that the work of the psychotherapy session was really to explore the unique familial and cultural issues in Kathy's life and help her to find an option that would not require that she give up either, what, either of her two primary relationships, the relationship with her lover or the relationship with her parents. Uh, while Kathy felt certain that her Korean and family cultures would not approve of this relationship, she also felt that she could not be true to herself if she denied herself, finally, a, a real relationship with someone outside of the family. In balancing the needs of the family against her own personal needs, much of Kathy's work was to define for herself what was more important to her. At this developmental stage, Kathy did understand that she was in the process of having a separation, an individualization from her family, and this was a process that actually had begun before she fell in love with Darlene, and that this process is something that is going to be continuing for her for the rest of her life as long as she lives in the United States and got this co college education. We talked about how she couldn't step back, that she couldn't just say, you know, now that I'm, I understand these things, now that I've felt these things, I've understand, had a relationship with a, another person who's not my family, not a cousin or not someone that um, I've known all my life, it opened up a side of her that she never saw. Um, and the form that the individuation would take was different from what many Korean women her age would experience through marriage. But Kathy realized that she could no longer turn back what she'd begun and ex to establish her own sense of independence. So our goals then focused on how she could integrate her independence um, with her family's expectations of marriage and what they considered acceptable behavior. Uh, Kathy was frightened of her parents' anger and rejection, but she believed that she was raised in a blended culture, both Korean and American. Um, and she felt supported by her friends who were now her new peer, <laughs> peer group, and her, and her partner, or her lover, Darlene, who felt strongly that, of course, Kathy should pursue her own identity and her own desires. Um, what she did was really role play a number of discussions about her parents. Um, she rehearsed how she would react, how she would continue to move the conversation a little further every time. She was completely afraid of her parents' reaction um, and extremely uh, fearful, but she made small, slow progress in becoming um, more open. She did disappoint Darlene, who was far more impatient and more direct and um, unhappy of the slow, slow progress that Kathy made, but she decided she was, you know, Kathy decided she was going to be slowly more open with her family about her relationship with Darlene, and she told her family that, um, that she had a special friend who she wanted her parents to meet. Um, she had a strong desire to integrate both of her, um, both her partner and her family, and um, she explored a number of options, including not disclosing her relationship, but she used the f language of family inclusion when she, when she told her family about Darlene and discussing her relationship, rather than individual identity saying, I want you to include this person who is like family to me since I'm away from you, my family. Um, Kathy's parents were initially you know, perplexed. They didn't understand what this relationship could be. They didn't recognize it, but they did maintain their con connection with Kathy. And Kathy persisted in bringing um, Darlene's name up and inviting her family over when Darlene was present. Slowly, they became more accustomed to her, but Never did she actually come out to her family. I worked with her over a period of, this is sort of a, 
not entirely one person, but <laughs> a composite, but I worked with someone like this over a period of three years. And what, um, what I really tried to allow her um, was the pace she found tolerable and to work with a sense of loss at not being her, um, her dutiful, uh, married, and proper uh, Korean daughter, the one that her parents desired. It was important to acknowledge that it was a loss, that um, there were, while there were positive aspects of finding independence and a new relationship and being her own person, she was also um, m you know, mourning and understanding that she had lost something else with her parents. And she talked about it as negotiating a tightrope for many, many years. Um, the second case is a case of Chung Lo. Uh, he was born in uh, Los Angeles, and he had an older brother, Chung An. Uh, they were from China. He attended Chung, both Chung An and Chung Lo attended City College, and they lived at home in the Los Angeles area. Um, they attended the Protestant church with the family, um, and over time, um, they commuted to class. The routine of the family re remained intact over many years. Meals were always eaten together. Chores were regular. Schedules were consistent. During his second year in college, Chung Lo met a Chinese classmate who introduced him to a, um, to a local Chinese evangelical church where many young people were members. Chung Lo was introverted and reserved, but he became interested in the group, and he started regular attendance. This was his only social network outside of his family. Um, though Chung Lo was acquainted with his, you know, with his classmates, he didn't have any strong relationships until he um, started attending this church. And up to this, he had no social relationships or sexual involvement, either men or women. So he's 28 years old. Chung Lo was approached by Stephen, a 28-year-old white male who worked in close proximity to his own firm and whom he'd seen many times walking down the street. Chung Lo was surprised and intrigued by this attention. Um, they began to meet for lunch, and over the next month, Chung Lo became sexually involved with Stephen. Typically, they would meet after work at Stephen's apartment. However, Chung Lo would never stay long and refused to stay overnight, which he was afraid would disrupt the order in his family's home. He was aware that his behavior would not be acceptable to his parents, but as long as he continued to be consistent in his family duties, um, to play the role of son, to show up at family gatherings, um, uh, dating Stephen wouldn't raise any questions. Chung Lo was resistant to spending much time for, with Stephen as religion condemned homosexuality, although he was very fond of him and he liked regular contact with Stephen. He did make limits on his time with Stephen and his availability to him made the conflict he was feeling more tolerable. Uh, Chung Lo and Stephen began couples therapy at Stephen's insistence. Stephen became unsatisfied with the relationship with Chung Lo over time. Chung Lo was initially reluctant to participate uh, because he was uncomfortable with the idea of entering couples therapy and talking about his uh, feelings in front of another person. However, Stephen insisted and said if he didn't go with him, uh, he would end the relationship. So the initial sessions involved a careful assessment of the couples pre presenting difficulties, their relationship history and cultural attitudes. Chung Lo spoke very little in the opening sessions, not surprisingly. He was somewhat defensive. He initially viewed the process as alien to him and as a hostile attempt to change his beliefs and values. But he gradually warmed up to it um, because it became clear to him that the therapist was interested in exploring his perspectives as well as his culture and his family. Uh, the process of therapy focused on helping both men communicate more effectively. I mean, what, what couples therapy doesn't, right? <laughs> Help them communicate more effectively, but it, basically it was focused on understanding cultural perspectives and emotional needs. So eventually, Chung Lo incorporated his homosexual behavior into his life by carefully compartmentalizing his involvement with Stephen, viewing him as a secret sexual partner and companion, and limiting the romantic or love attachment. His primary attachments remained primarily with his family. He experienced only minor distress regarding his relationship with Stephen, given that it had a little impact for his public family life. Um, after the problem was defined and the individual and couple histories were explored, Chung Lo and Stephen were asked to verbalize to each other what their hopes, their dreams, and disappointments were. Initially, this was diff difficult for both partners, um, but Chung Lo began to be more expressive of his beliefs. Um, Stephen was encouraged to try asking questions instead of demanding or um, complaining, and Chung Lo was encouraged to express more of his feelings about what he 
felt about the relationship. Over time, Stephen began asking Chung Lo to express more affection and commitment without demanding um, a commitment. This request was confusing and sometimes irritating for Chung Lo because he felt his affection and his commitment did not need to be verbalized in order to be felt. <laughs> uh, it's a style consistent with his family and his cultural ways. Stephen had difficulty accepting this style because he perceived that a mutually satisfying relationship must be based on verbal communication and expression of love and affection, a distinctly Western and particularly American ethos. Um, finally, um, Chung Lo's time with his family became a source of conflict for the couple. Stephen often felt excluded, frustrated that Chung Lo spent more time with his family than with him. Stephen also felt hurt that Chung Lo seemed always to place his family responsibilities and plans above the two of them doing things. Um, consistent with uh, his family dynamics, Chung Lo expressed his belief that his family would always have to come first. Um, he was able to recognize and say that he valued Stephen, and sometimes he felt guilty that he couldn't meet Stephen's expectations, but um, he felt he could not change his family loyalties and values, for that would mean changing himself. Uh, so although he loved his own family, uh, Stephen thought intimate relationships should be the most important primary relationship. This is why it's called primary, he said. <laughs> Again, the cultural dis differences and discrepancies between their expectations um, of a relationship were paramount. So over the last session with the therapist, both partners came to understand more about their um, relationship expectations and were better able to understand and articulate their feelings. Chung Lo was satisfied with the level of intimacy and contact, but he wanted Stephen to respect and accept that their relationship would always, for Chung Lo, be secondary to his family. Stephen felt strongly about Chung Lo, but felt that the intimacy in the relationship was not sufficient, and spending time together was necessary. Eventually, both of them decided to cool the relationship because their individual needs were not being adequately met. The final sessions focused on the couple sharing what they had learned about each other and themselves. Both partners achieved greater clarity, clarity about their attitudes toward relationships and what they would look for in future partners. Although such an ending lacks a happily ever after expectation that usually follows in stories of couples <laughs> therapy, the mutual respect and self-understanding that accompanied their separation rendered this therapy a qualified kind of success. The positive therapeutic alliance with each client made it more likely that each partner would be open to other kinds of professional help in the future. But clearly, Chung Lo's resolve to relinquish his relationship with Stephen to preserve family harmony cannot be easily to easy to maintain, and perhaps he will go on to seek other partners and find other resolutions, or perhaps he will find other partners whose relationship expectations and priorities might match his own. And that was the, the key, that he, he, he realized um, where those lie, where his priorities lie. So um, in, in conclusion, I would say that from uh, young to old, to different kinds of families, um, to small families, and to other families uh, that are larger, and to the future, um, what I, what I conclude is that with the growing population of Asian Americans in the United States, the issues for Asian Americans and their families become increasingly relevant for many therapists, not just those working with Asian Americans, but within the American um, culture that has been shifting. Um, research on lesbian, gay, Asian Americans, and indeed Asian Americans in general and their family, and their family in terms of therapy is minimal at this stage and study of this population is difficult for a number of reasons. Um, these include cultural inhibitions regarding discussion of sexuality, a lack of visibility, difficulty in obtaining research participants, and I didn't even talk about the wide disparity between acculturation, assimilation, and experiences. Um, but over time, as we overcome some of these barriers, learning more about the lives and experiences of East Asian Americans and their couple and family relationships are very helpful to mental health professionals working with this population. Um, we have a number of different kinds of clinical education and, um, and uh, prevention programs in terms of uh, mental health, and providing consultation to institutions and agencies is an important um, 
as an important new field for, for Asian Americans. So my, my talk is a, an attempt to um, look at uh, the ways in which religious values, family values, cultural values, and individual values come together. And in terms of sexuality and behavior, those contexts of religion, culture, and sexuality um, come together and help explain, I think, behaviors in different ways than other people have looked at in the past. And so um, that's, that's, what, that's my, that's my uh, argument and my contribution to, to this field. So thank you. I'm glad to take questions. And I'm glad to take questions. And I certainly invite you know, any of, particularly the Asian, Asian or Asian Americans in the audience to talk about their own family um, and cultural beliefs and how you know, some of what I said might have resonated or might not have, that maybe your experience has been different, or people who've worked with um, Asian and Asian American clients. Great. So we have a microphone, and I'd ask you to wait until the microphone is actually in your hand before speaking so that your questions get picked up on the tape. Hi. Um, I was just curious about how your cases identify themselves in terms of sexual orientation. Hmm. If they, if in fact they didn't identify it as LGBTQ, mm -hmm. or they didn't go into that. I think um, that's a that's a good question. In, initially, I would say that neither of them identified as um, gay or lesbian, and. I don't think Chung Lo ever identified as, as gay. Um, he felt that his uh, behavior was such, or his desire was, was um, more for men, and he considered, later on, he considered getting married um, to fulfill the role. So he wouldn't consider him. But I thought that over time, the first case, Kathy, um, did eventually consider herself a lesbian and, and maintain that relationship. Um, I, I thought your case was really fascinating. I'm reminded of a friend of mine from uh, Beijing who her story was uh, falling in love uh, with a, a girlfriend at college mm -hmm. and wanting so much. Well, I'm, 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 I'm adding things in from your story, so I'll just tell you what <laughs> happened. So, so she told her family all about this wonderful friend she had, and actually the girlfriend came home to live with my friend during the summer mm -hmm. and just hang around the house as like a family friend and just became completely incorporated into the family just as like a, a good a wonderful girlfriend right. and so this was like the best of both worlds that mm -hmm. this lover was now part, part of, of the, the family. family of course it was never said that this was a lover mm -hmm. and so at one point the mother found them in bed together by basically you know they, they were sleeping in like twin separate beds in a shared room like mm -hmm. sisters you know uh, open the the bedroom door in the morning and and saw the girls in bed together uh, you know mm -hmm. and then a later asked my friend what's what's going on and of course so my friend denied that it was you know she just you know for, refused to engage <laughs> refused. and and you know you know made something up and it was never addressed again right. and you know a decade has gone by um, and the family has never referred to this so I'm, mm. I'm, I'm wondering if this is a kind of a don't ask don't tell yes. type situation yes. so what happened then with my friend though there was mm -hmm. still so much pressure like you said all the, mm. the meeting the family expectations and in fact she went to pursue graduate school as a way to forestall the question when are you getting married mm. as a way to give herself another decade wow. to to mm -hmm. not face that question but yet the family still might know. Uh -huh. So so I, I just I, I this you know your talk kinda helped me understand this case hmm. a little better. No. Oh. Okay, well it's not not as unusual as, as you think. <laughs> um, in fact it's pretty my understanding is it's often quite common that um, people will bring in you know, some of you may have seen the movie Wedding Banquet where um, the, the the man lives with a roommate, but then the family um, arranges a marriage, and he actually goes ahead and gets married. But then, it, it, you know, sort of it's sort of a Western ending. <laughs> it's sort of found out. But these you know um, these kinds of relationships do stay within the context of the family for a long time. And 
there, it, it is rarely spoken of, almost never, it, it, except for maybe a quick confrontation. There is, I actually have a title of another article I wrote was talking about Asian sexuality is a kind of don't ask, don't tell. And as long as no one speaks it, no one says anything, you can often co continue the role and you can even continue a relationship as long as um, the primary relationship, you know, if, if, if you're married is, is to the marriage, but you can have a relationship on the side as long as you keep the role. Or you could stay in the family and be an unmarried daughter and have like a best friend you live with for years, <laughs> decades, uh, but you still maintain, it's still a don't ask, don't tell. It's still maintaining that, that separation um, from, from having a true relation, like a partner relationship to the family. And it's tolerable, it's not, in fact, people ask me, they say, is that a tolerable relationship? I said, it's not only tolerable, it's perfectly acceptable. It can go on for years and could be happy for everybody involved. So, yeah. So the parents, they, they, they treat this girlfriend as a very special, the, the, the parents then uh -huh. see the girlfriend as sure. a special friend, but they may know themselves, but they don't say. Is, They'll is that never say, I don't think. But they know. <laughs> but they know, that's right, they know, it's just special. Yeah, but, uh, but probably neither side will ever say. And that's part of the, sort of what I was trying to talk about in terms of Asian culture, the indirect is okay. You avoid the conflict, it's the harmony. The, yeah, it's part of the, the cultural beliefs. Yeah. My question is not about the sexual identity, but about okay. something that you referred to earlier on when I think you spoke about Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism as uh -huh. somehow not incongruent. Uh, and then- With each other. With each other. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, I've had the experience over the years, and uh, I'm trying to uh, account for this, hmm. when I will have Korean Christian students in the mm -hmm. School of Theology, uh, and some will be Methodist and some will be Presbyterian, mm -hmm. And they make it a point of differentiating one from the other and being very clear, I am Presbyterian, uh -huh. or the other, I'm Methodist. And I, I'm curious about this. I don't know how much this has to do with mm -hmm. being in a school of theology. I don't know how much this has <laughs> to do with uh, being in the West. Uh -huh. I don't know how much of it has to do with a different status that being uh -huh. not only Christian, but a kind of a Christian kind of has Christian. Uh -huh. that uh, distinguish itself from what's the background of these traditions that may be more or less congruent. So in other words, is being Christian uh, congruent, but does it, is it assimilated as having a different status that doesn't fit among all of these? Uh, I, I don't know what to make of it. That's why I'm <laughs> sticking aloud with you about that. I think you're right. <laughs> I think that because Christian, I'm, I'm assuming that Christianity is probably more newer to them than something they grew up with. In so, some instances, yes, but in some instances, yeah. they may be second and third generation pastors. Uh huh. But they're still making a distinction. Yes. I don't know. Maybe somebody. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I, you know, I do know that um, most of my reading around um, the difference, differences and the differentiations between Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism, and and even being able to have that with a Christian lens does lend me to believe that it is a little bit in terms of the cultural and the religious values of the family is sort of like picking what you, what you want and absorbing the others, kind of like it's around, so you absorb it. Um, if these, are, these must be, you're talking about second generation, third generation, that are they in the United States or they're they, from? They have, they have just come. They are immigrants. They are, they are not I living see. here. They have just come from Korea. Uh, but they have a religious background that extends several generations, yes. um, a strong religion. But they're very clear in terms of being oh, yes. not uh, just I mean, Christians. That's, that's right. <laughs> Method, not just Christians, but not Christians just of Christians. a certain sort, and certainly not huh. that kind of Christian. I don't know if uh, what's Do you, know, do you know, have an answer to this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm half Korean, half Japanese, and my fa my parents are uh, Christian. And usually, we just say we are Christian. Um, mm -hmm. But um, and then 
in Korea, I, uh, Christianity is a dominant religion in in the country now. That I never really heard people distinguishing themselves from each other relig uh, other denomination. But sometimes when you are in a oppressive minority status within that um, denomination, you might tend to emphasize that you come from this. Or maybe like certain denomination is more considered as a majority and not the minority one, then you might want to, to let you know that you come from this majority, uh, uh, the uh, mainstream denomination rather than minority. So that's my guess. Hmm. Interesting. I think one of the issues about uh, in Korea mm -hmm. of uh, denominational belonging is that the Christian missionaries who went there and the uh, Protestant missionaries in the 1880s uh, were very exclusivist themselves. And they thought it was very important to be a Christian and to reject the Asian culture. Mm, mm. And then the Presbyterians and Methodists disagreed, and so it was important to reject that. And sometimes that carries down uh, from uh, one generation to the next, although there are a, a number of Korean students who come here to study um, for the sake of figuring out how to reconcile their Confucian heritage mm. uh, with the kind of Christianity they have. Mm. I have a, 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 another question, though. Uh, I know uh, a young man who's uh, Chinese, Malaysian, raised in Malaysia, came to the United States for college and graduate school. Uh, he's gay uh, and is an ordained minister in the Metropolitan mm -hmm. Community Church, which is the gay church. Uh, and his uh, ambition is to develop um, a gay theology uh, and go back to Malaysia to establish uh, branches of the Metropolitan uh, Church mm. there mm -hmm. in order to allow the Chinese Malaysians to mm. come out. Mm -hmm. uh, he's very excited about the fact that the, uh, uh, the, the word that uh, gays use to refer to one another uh -huh. is the same uh, that uh, we translate as comrade uh -huh. in communist China. To be <laughs> a, a communist comrade uh -huh. is, is uh, that's to be a, uh -huh. a, a gay partner. And so I w wouldn't you see this as a kind of reverse move from what you have seen? <laughs> uh -huh. uh, as his family is several, has several dislocations uh -huh. uh, from the traditional Confucian culture, although he says that surely he was raised as a Confucian. Uh -huh. uh, but he's uh, meaning to reassemble uh -huh. a new kind of cultural identity, a new family, mm. uh, but through the, um, uh, the, the ministry of the church. Mm as opposed to an inherited family, mm -hmm. which is a Christian, as opposed to a Confucian. Right, 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 Christian. Yeah, huh. that's very interesting. Um, certainly there are uh, people I used to belong and, and be part, um, spend time with a, a, an Asian um, group, and it was kind of mixed from all kinds of religions and sexualities. And we had um, people, men, who were from Malaysia, and from Singapore. And the men from Malaysia did talk about um, wanting to go back to Mal Malaysia and sort of changing things. They really had a hope of changing the society in a, in a different way. The men from Singapore wanted to get, um, wanted to have a child. It's <laughs> the only way I can put it. Wanted, wanted to know if um, either I or someone I knew would have their child so they could they could fulfill that responsibility of being um, being a father. And that was, I think, for many of the men that I knew who were either gay or um, gay identified felt that the importance of um, having heirs carrying on the family line was even stronger than sexuality. Um, that many of them talked about you know, being able to keep the role of um, being a, a son and a father and also having <laughs> um, a Western, you know, your, your other desires, but I, I hadn't heard about going back to Malaysia and starting an MCC chapter. How was his, how did his family um, handle it? He doesn't talk about the way his family back okay. in Malaysia uh, receives this. I think there's probably some significant alienation. Okay. Uh, his partner is Puerto Rican. Oh, I see. I know, it looks like it's time.
You've been a great I'm audience. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop the formal part of the program, but we do have uh, some refreshments over here. I think we can stay and talk for a while, but for those of you who need to get going, uh, let's close the formal part so you're released. Thank you again. Thank you. You've been a great audience.